Sanctuary is where life is precious, is guarded. It's a place where life is sacred and safe. In 1982, when the U.S. wars against the poor in Central America were raging. Thousands of refugees were fleeing to the United States. When the whole sanctuary conversation came up, we started hearing reports from a sister church down in Tucson that people were arriving to their church with bullet holes in them, fleeing unbelievable violence and desperation. Hundreds of refugees found sanctuary at the Southside Presbyterian Church in Tucson, Arizona. That church's action catalyzed the Chicago Religious Task Force in El Salvador, and they asked Reverend Dan Dale to find other congregations to declare themselves a sanctuary as well. Wellington was on my short list of five congregations because of its history as one of the places that would that lived its faith in action, and that if I challenged them to risk breaking an unjust law, that they might be willing to do it. So the word got up to us, and so we started looking at what could we do to help that. It was not an instantaneous yes from the congregation, because of course there were practical issues to consider, the possibility of our minister being arrested. And so it was really a, a very heartfelt and deep theological reflection. What will we risk to be faithful? Do we really believe the gospel? There were voices within the congregation that uh, were saying, we've already done our part. Why do we have to engage around every new uh, justice issue? And there were other voices that were saying that this is a new point of witness in which the church needs to express a prophetic voice. After careful discernment, prayer, and reflection, Wellington said yes. We initially, a Salvadoran family, the Guevara family, who lived within our church, so that they could be safe from the violence that was threatening uh, their lives in El Salvador. They um, occupied the, uh, an apartment on the third floor in the gym and, and um, were afraid for quite a long time to come out. It was emotional, wasn't it? You know, here are these real people who've been through Lord knows what, you know? horrible things. They did come down to speak to the congregation several times with masks on so they could not be identified. In Central America we were using death squads. If a, a refugee told the truth about what, what had happened to them and their village and their family, the U.S. supported death squads would assassinate their family members still in El Salvador. I also heard a story when Reverend Simone did the first worship service when the family was present, and it was a communion service. As they were preparing the table and going through the words for communion, he took a vase full of wine and poured it into the chalice, talking about the refugees, the fears, the violence that disappeared, the murder, and the wine kept flowing over the chalice, onto the table and the floor, to remind us that these are serious matters. Blood has been shed. 
And that's why you need to gather as community around that table to be support to one another. We were at the forefront of building the sanctuary movement and we believe deeply in uh, the fact that the church should be a sanctuary for people in need and for people fleeing. I credit Wellington a lot for sort of being on the front lines of that movement and teaching so many of us, like, yeah, this is how you do faithful resistance in the world. If you present a congregation with a challenge to be faithful in which they have to risk something. This is something that comfortable, privileged North American Christians almost never have to do. And Wellington chose to do so. And with that prophetic example, over 500 congregations said yes. Meanwhile, the role of the tent maker at Wellington continued to expand. James Harper, born in the poorest section of Chicago's West Side, was an alcoholic by the age of 12 and often homeless. A chance meeting with Wellington member Ann Brinks, whom he later married and had three children, brought him into the congregation. James challenged the Wellington congregation to keep working within their own neighborhood. James created Save the Alcoholic, which later became the Center for Street People, an organization devoted to welcoming the homeless, providing them counseling, food, and clothing. It was a ministry to which he devoted the rest of his life. For those who knew him best, like longtime friends and supporters, Dick and Reverend Nan Conser, he was called a bridge his wife Anne would write of him, James dreamed of a community caring for each other, where you are loved and cared for by God. He took what could have been a wretched life, caught in the circumstances of birth and environment, and lived out a life filled with integrity, concern, purpose, and accomplishment. His work was cut short, however, when he was diagnosed with cancer. On May 7, 1983, surrounded by family and friends in the hospital chapel, he was ordained and affirmed by the United Church of Christ. One week later, the Reverend James Harper passed away. After his death, an inscription was placed in the center that he founded. It read, He comes to us where we live and he loves us where we are. When artist John Volkening began attending the church in 1980, he had a vision for what services could look like, not with ornate decorations or luxurious displays, but with profound works of art. John's installations added depth, intensity, and meaning to the sanctuary, and he was named Wellington's first minister of liturgical arts. Among his most beloved works was a cross made of cracked mirrors. I really wanted something that would reflect the congregation, that would reflect light. 
that would show that, that being cracked, as we all are in some kind of way, is a really beautiful thing, and that we're all reflected in that resurrection light. And it really represented those who were broken uh, by the world. Not many churches are, are willing to go that deep, but Wellington could. Wellington's acknowledgement that we are all cracked and broken, but reflected in the resurrection light, was exemplified when the church co-founded the night ministry for runaway teenagers. Church members were trained to handle and distribute sterile syringes and needles, condoms and food, and volunteers met teens on the streets where they slept. In addition, the congregation made a decision to offer its fellowship hall as a homeless shelter. For seven nights a week over two years, church members laid out beds, cooked and served both dinner and breakfast, and supplied bathrooms and showers for dozens of people. Since Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the threat of a nuclear war had loomed over the entire planet. In the decades after the war, Russia and the United States built more and more weapons, edging ever closer to the possibility of mutually assured destruction. Throughout the 1960s and 70s, armed warheads were ubiquitous, placed in towns and cities, near shopping malls, parks, and schools. Going back to the nuclear age, I mean, this was a time when Dick Simpson hung a big sign out in front of Wellington Church, nuclear free zone, and we were talking a lot about how the scientific clock was pointing more and more towards 12, Lakeview had actually been the center for a Nike site with nuclear weapons, or at least a Nike site to, uh, to blow down any missiles that were headed to Chicago. There were demonstrations at the Nike site there at the Belmont Harbor. That didn't get removed until the 70s. That may seem like an odd thing now, but back then, Chicago was uh, one of the epicenters of where a nuclear attack would be. When I was in the circle, the communion circle around our table at Wellington, it, it hit me one day, this is where I want to be if there's a nuclear attack. I want to be with these people in this place, joining hands in communion. The church's involvement in the anti-nuclear movement went far beyond the neighborhood. In 1984, the youth group adapted and performed Dr. Seuss's Butter Battle. There are two groups that are at odds with each other, the ones that butter their bread butter side up and ones that butter it butter side down. The differences in their beliefs about how you should butter your bread come to the point where it could turn into war. Complicating matters was the fact that Dr. Seuss's estate did not want Wellington to use the material without receiving compensation. As it frequently did, the church turned to longtime member Earl Talbot, a lawyer in the congregation who provided decades of counsel. One thing I learned in the legal business was uh, it's easier to get forgiveness than to get permission. So you don't ask, you do it. And what are they going to do to you? And we took it to the Democratic National Convention in San Francisco. And we carried all those crazy props around that were made out of paper towel holders and cardboard boxes and all those recycled materials. And somehow they made it all the way to San Francisco from Chicago because they were pieced together so delicately. But it was really special. It wasn't just a play, but it was a message. 
behind that that play, which was really important, and we all we all knew that message. It was an incredible adventure and statement of of peace. By the end of the 80s, Wellington by all measures had fulfilled its mission of peace and justice. The congregation was not done, however. Once again, as the old Union song reminds us, the rising of the women means the rising of us all. It began with um, a lesbian couple going to see David and sitting down and saying to him, you know, we can't sing these hymns. The hymns all say him for God, and that's not who we are. We're she, we're female, we're her. And so hymns were changed. Before we sang a hymn, we would take our pencils and our pens and cross out the masculine terms and write in the terms that were inclusive. We either made God gender neutral or alternated he and she for the divine, which was quite radical. Well, that's sort of the beauty of Wellington, right? I mean, I think it's so accepting of ideas, you know, it's like, oh, okay, we'll do that then. That sounds great. I do like to think about how Dave Chevrier addressed the AIDS crisis in the city in the 80s, which was not treated at all by our government. And the leaders in the city or the nation in the 80s, members of our church were dying too. And every Sunday, there was a call to action. It made me realize that this is what church should be about. One of my favorite communion memories, it's when the altar was up in the chancel area. People had to walk up to gather around the communion table. And we had a man who used to come here, his name was Ron. And it was back in the 80s and he had AIDS. And he, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> he had to be helped up the stairs by two people. And um, he would come up and the congregation made sure that he drank out of the cup first because we didn't want to give him anything. Instead of being afraid of him, we were afraid that we would make him sick. Communion connects me to each other in the room, you know, when we stand up and we're actually able to be together and just are in a, a circle passing, passing the bread and the wine and the, and the juice. It's a community. When you need a hand, there it is. Why? It's a family. We're part of a family. And that, that to me is, that's the church. I think the most important thing was we all prayed together. We all sang together. We all hugged together. We all ate together. Everything was together. Nobody was an outsider. Everybody was included. It was just a together place to be in the house of God. As when they welcomed the Good Shepherd Parish in 1973, the church continued to open its doors to the LGBTQ community. Throughout the 1980s, AIDS was rampant, and the rest of the society turned a blind eye. ACT UP, a group of AIDS activists, were drawn to Wellington's commitment to being open and affirming, and there they found a safe place to organize protests. 
The church was among the first religious organizations to participate in Chicago's Gay Pride Parade, and Wellington members have marched every year since. In 1993, Wellington made a covenant with Reverend Sid Moan and with Reverend Craig Moosen, who was one of the church's leading voices in welcoming refugees and undocumented asylum seekers. South African song. It comes from the townships, locations, reservations, whichever, near the cities of South Africa, where all the black South Africans live. The children shout from the streets as they see police cars coming to raid their homes for one thing or another. They say, Kauleza Mama, which simply means, hurry, Mama, please. Please don't let them catch you. Probably one of the most important parts of my life here at Wellington was my involvement in the anti-apartheid movement. When the church was protesting against the First National Bank selling the South African Cougaran, and it was like, how crazy is that? That the church, you know, it's gonna Want, not want a bank to sell cooking. What's the difference? And and they went out there and they protested. I thought it's there's never going to be a chance that that they're going to be successful. And I just remember pushing the baby stroller with my child in it in front of the First National Bank of Chicago, shouting First National Bank out of South Africa. And lo and behold, First National Bank said we're going to stop selling cooking. So it was like, when you look back, it was, wow, that was a pretty impressive thing that a little group did. Betty Benson just devoted her life to justice. And you know, was out there, rain, winter, summer, fall, in front of the South African embassy with her silent vigil, saying wrong, apartheid wrong. In addition to protesting the investment of First National Bank, in the apartheid government's gold. The congregation also questioned the United Church of Christ's own role in funding apartheid. Wellington requested a financial officer from the national UCC to clarify the church's position on investments in South African cougarans. The UCC officer initially justified the investment on behalf of the denomination. The UCC was investing in gold, uh, for the regime supporting it, and here we were being hypocrites. After years of advocacy by Reverend David Chevrier, Reverend Fred Trost, and others, the National UCC decided to divest. Collins Ramusi, who was on the death list by the South African government because he was part of the ANC, he came to Wellington because he knew of our work in the anti-apartheid movement. He would pray and urge us, pray without ceasing to end apartheid in South Africa. Six years after Collins Ramusi's initial visit to Wellington, his wife Esther came with a delegation of women from South Africa. And when they came into our sanctuary, they were wearing the most outstandingly beautiful outfits. It made us all tear up because it was just so beautiful and so powerful. I don't think I have ever been as moved by music in my life as I was by that South African choir. You could just hear the, you know, the centuries of oppression that they had lived under but their kind of indomitable spirit. In the early 1990s, Collins Ramusi invited a Wellington delegation to South Africa. Barbara England and Eloise Chevrier made the journey. Then in 1994, in the weeks leading up to Nelson Mandela's historic election, Elaine Clement visited South Africa as well. We were in a tiny, tiny village and we did have ballots and an elderly woman came up to me and she took the ballot and she took her finger and went down like this 
And Mandela's picture was about three quarters of the way down. She finished and she said, now I can die in peace because I am considered a full human being. When Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990, the United States imposed devastating economic sanctions on the Iraqi people. President George H. W. Bush deployed U.S. forces to the region, as did over 30 other nations. In January of 1991, the United States invaded Iraq in the first Gulf War. I remember um, coming back from Iraq in 19. 91. By the time I came back, really, people had forgotten about that war. And, and, and I realized a lot of people, they had other things to think about and worry about and care about. What I really appreciated about Wellington is that people honestly did care. They cared about people in war zones, in places like Iraq, and, and cared deeply. Their, their hearts were so open. So Wellington had a tremendous capacity for collective care um, about people that they might never personally meet, whom they would hold up in their prayer, in their rhythms of liturgy, in their identification of what it meant to try to be disciples and to follow Jesus. The first Gulf War lasted only a month, but cost over $60 billion, hundreds of American military lives, and hundreds of thousands of Iraqi civilians. Wellington organized to offer relief from the destructive effects of the economic sanctions by sending infant care kits to the people of Iraq. As with the Vietnam War, the church sent a delegation to a Washington, D.C. March for Peace. Wellington also sent members to protest an atrocity much closer to home. Fort Benning housed the infamous School of the Americas, which is a U.S. supported, sponsored, funded school that trained Latin American soldiers, the same kind of soldiers that threatened the families that we took into sanctuary. We are long time uh, members with the School of the Americas Watch, which has a 30 year history of gatherings in Fort Benning, where the School of the Americas is located. And so Wellington people would gather at Fort Benning. Chris and Sarah had organized a group of kids to sing on stage. And my daughter was one of those kids. And I remember she gave a pretty powerful little testimony having come from Chiapas, Mexico. For decades, Wellington commissioned groups of congregants to protest at the gates of Fort Benning, Georgia, many of whom were arrested carrying out nonviolent acts of civil disobedience. It's not common to find another congregation that has that mística, we would say in Spanish, that sense of a central aspect of its faith uh, being justice. Wellington spread its concern for human rights elsewhere, from across the street to across the world. Refugees from Kosovo and Afghanistan were sent care kits, and members lobbied legislators in Springfield for universal health care. Work continued against police brutality and the death penalty. Timeline Theater moved into Baird Hall, beginning a decades-long relationship with Wellington and cementing the church's support of the arts. Wellington strengthened its resolve to support LGBTQ rights. The church continued to participate in the Chicago Pride Parade, dedicated a Gay Pride Sunday, 
donated to the Matthew Shepard Memorial Fund and AIDS education programs, and sponsored an LGBTQ film festival. Wellington office space was given to the Pink Angels, a citizen-led movement dedicated to stopping crime against the LGBTQ community. As the church approached its 100th year and the 20th century drew to a close, Wellington's commitment to faith in action was as vibrant as ever. Soon that commitment would be tested as a new age of war and terror dawned. In response to the attacks of September 11, 2001, the United States launched a global war on terror and for the second time in as many decades, invaded Iraq. Once again, billions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of lives were wasted. Every family that has to bury a loved one, it's a very private ceremony. You have your family, your friends, and, that, and that's it. And the private grief really leads to very personal questions, like why my son or daughter, why my husband or wife? But this is a public memorial that allows all of us to have some sense of public grief and mourning. And the public grief leads to political questions. Why this war? As with the war in Vietnam, Reverend Michael McConnell used his Wellington tentmaker role to continue his witness for peace as the Midwest Regional Director of the American Friends Service Committee. We knew there was so much that the public did not know. And so we kept living with it. How do we show the American public uh, the human cost of this war. I remember in Washington, May of 2004, and there was a woman that came up, a young woman who had lost her uncle, who was also her godfather. And we looked all over for her boots, and she just sat down by these pair of boots and wept. And it was like, all of a sudden it hit me. I mean, this is a way for people to show their grief. Wellington undertook an active peace campaign in opposition to the Iraq War. Kathy Kelly returned to Wellington and spoke about her experience in Iraq, while congregants marched, held vigils, and participated in civil disobedience. Being in an anti-war march and seeing Michael McConnell, who had organized it, and also seeing, I think, Chris and Sarah and maybe the Wellington Choir singing, you know, at this rally, um, it, it made me proud. As always, the women of Wellington were at the forefront with a small group forming what became known as the Raging Grannies. We stood on that bridge over the Outer Drive. It was colder than cold. The policemen, of course, uh, they didn't know what they were taking on, these older women. And they told us that we couldn't be doing this on private property. And we said, oh, it's not private property. We went to many, many other locations. Wellington also joined the American Friends Service Committee's Campaign for Conscience by providing aid to the Iraqi people in violation of U.S. law committing to debt cancellation for third world countries in the Jubilee 2000 movement, supporting refugees from Afghanistan and Angola, giving housing to Colombian human rights workers, all the while working with the Knight Ministry and cooking for homeless shelters. 
Wellington also took a leadership role in advocating for health care justice, as Reverend Chevrier preached in the early 2000s. While Christians don't have to take a position on every issue, on matters of justice, they have no choice. The central meaning of the gospel is, true faith always implies action. Faith without action is no faith at all. The beginning of the century also saw the end of an era. After 33 years of transformative leadership, Wellington said goodbye to David and Eloise Chevrier. I remember I played a lot of Bach, and I, I can't not play Bach any time today and not think of David. It was at his retirement, I can see his face and see his whole body when he would listen to music. His eyes were closed and he would sort of lift his head a little and, and he would rock. And you could tell that no matter what it was, it was just moving through him. David Chevrier preaching about Lazarus after his heart attack, and no one believed that he was going to make it back as the person that he was. And it was an astonishing sermon um, and just such a great moment. So David was a great preacher, a great mentor, uh, a great friend. He just spoke to my heart when I came in here. That's why I joined this church. You know, when I started at Wellington, David was just about winding down. And for me, this is what the gospel is all about. This is what Christ really intended for us to be, to be our brother's keeper, right? To pay attention to the marginalized, to welcome all people, to love your neighbor as yourself. Now go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. So 